Mark, good to uh, good to see you. It's it's been a while. I I have determined coming into this that you in fact are living your best life. Uh, I saw a tweet from you watching uh, Olympic bobsled people train to be bobsledders. Uh, you bought right. the Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, Tim, yeah, Timberwolves and the Lynx. Uh, you've launched Wonder, which we'll talk about. I've seen you learning to play basketball or improve your skills. And oh yeah, you're also trying to save civilization by building a city from scratch. My question to you, how are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Like you said, I'm living my best life. Uh, I've been out of Walmart about a year and, you know, I was there for a little over four years and started thinking about all the things I wanted to do in the future. And uh, when I came out of Walmart, I wound up doing them all in the first 12 months. So <laughs> I was like, I was like, check, 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 check. It sounds like you've been a serial entrepreneur. We'll go into a little bit in your career, check.com, Quincy before that. Uh, you spent some time at Walmart, but it sounds like You've been set free. You've been able to unleash your just innermost creativity and get back to what you love to do in life. Yeah, built companies. I ever since I was four years old, I wanted to be a farmer because they grow stuff from nothing, and I've been doing that ever since. I, I absolutely love it. People say, "Aren't you done? When are you going to stop?" And in some ways, they feel like I'm just getting going. Like I'm, I'm literally every company I learn another lesson that I say, "Okay, great, I'm going to do it from scratch with those lessons and do it again." And you know, now I think with Wonder, it's sort of um, you're going after a really big market that um, is in need, of, in need of disruption. And there's a real opportunity to be, be the leader in a really big market and to change how people eat and really make a positive impact uh, on the country and eventually the world like that. That's really what's motivating here. Well, I'm going to resist for just a second. I want to get into Wonder. I think it is a fascinating concept, but I did hear from a little birdie that you were trained to become an Olympian back in what, 1980. How did that even happen? Well, this was 19, yeah, 1996. 96. I, I sort of uh, stumbled upon it. At, they were doing a, um, an event at the World Trade Center downtown. And I was three years out of school and uh, they were offering, you know, uh, to build visibility for the bobsled team. You push the sled, they time you. And then they were there for a week and the fastest time got invited to like class to take a test. And uh, they called me up and said, hey, you got the fastest time this week. Do you want to go to Lake Placid and take this test? And I said, what happens if you pass it? They said, if you pass it, we'll train you to push the sled. And then we'll time you and see if you, know, you qualify for the U.S. national team. I was like, okay, I was a sprinter in college. And I was a few years out. I thought that was interesting. Um, but I didn't think anything of it until I got a call and said, you had the fastest time. Do you want to come? And I said, yes. I went up there and I passed the test and they trained me for a month and then there was the trials and yeah, then I made the, the, the team and uh, I had to choose whether I wanted to train with the team and go around the world or, or come back to, um, you know, back to work, back to reality. <laughs> and I chose, I chose right or wrong. I chose work back at that time. So. Oh, well, okay. Well now I understand, understand the tweet a little bit better. I, I wish Walmart would have put that in its annual report. It would have been a better read, but I do want to go over to wonder uh, fascinating business. What is it? Why'd you launch it? Sure, Brian. No, so, I, I mean, the best way to put it is imagine you're opening your front door and getting handed piping hot food that was just cooked and plated in front of your house in a sleek mobile kitchen from the best chefs and restaurants around the country in every cuisine in just minutes, all in a sustainable way and at a great price. That's basically wonder. Uh, we're a vertically integrated food tech company. And so we go out and we acquire the rights to the, to the country's best chefs and restaurants, restaurants like the Farrah Pizza. Uh, restaurants like uh, a M Middle Eastern restaurant called Maidan out of Washington, D.C. We've got a great Mexican restaurant called Barrio Cafe out of Phoenix. So different places around the country. And some of the greatest chefs, uh, Marcus Samerson, Bobby Flay, Nancy Silverton. Once we have those rights, we sort of work with them and their team to perfect the, the, the sort of menu so that we can prep the food in a big, massive central commissary kitchen. Then we'll load up these trucks for the day these mobile kitchens and these mobile kitchens will sort of roam around out on the road and they're completely available for you to just pull out your app and see, Oh, this truck to fire pizza is seven minutes away. You click on it. Seven minutes later, the truck pulls up, cooks the pizza outside your door, plates it, and then, and then brings it piping hot to you. Um, these are not food trucks. We're, we're utilizing, you know, high speed convection ovens. It's, it's, you know, three years of R and D in the making to kind of be able to, with 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 uh, not a, a a master chef in in the back of the truck to be able to 
create this incredible quality food really fast. And so we're uh, pride ourselves on on that R and D and the fact that we have food in our DNA. You know, we're we're food. We're a restaurant basically. Uh, you know, with with high tech. How'd you convince Bobby Flay that you can get his recipes right? We had to prove it to him. So, you know, he was one of the first believers early on. And I remember he came into our commissary and that's when we had to show him that we can cook the food the way um, it needs to be cooked. And he sat down and he tried the steak and he goes, oh, actually the steak is, is as good as my restaurant. This is great steak. But ob the obvious question is, how are you going to cook this, this quality, you know, in a mobile kitchen outside somebody's door. That, that's, what, that's what I don't get how you're gonna do it. He said, no, Bobby, that steak you're eating right there, that was cooked in a mobile kitchen. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no way, that's impossible. I gotta see this. So we brought him downstairs and showed him, took the sous vide steak, put it in the high speed convection oven, you know, hit the temperature and it came out perfect. Charred on the outside, incredible, like perfect temp in the inside. It was a great steak. And that was sort of, I think, that was very early on that we sort of proved to ourselves, yeah, with enough R&D, we can actually do this. We can actually create this incredible quality food um, right outside someone's door and do it affordably, too, because we're vertically integrated. Where do you have these mobile kitchens now? So right now we have about 70 mobile kitchens in five towns live in New Jersey. We started, you know, about a year ago and we keep adding towns. So we're in uh, Westfield, Mountainside, Garwood, Cranford and Short Hills. Those are the five we're in. And, and next year, we plan on rolling it out all, all over the tri-state area. We're going to add about 1,000 mobile kitchens next year. So we'll be in, in lots of areas in the tri-state area, including a test in lower Manhattan as well. Um, and then up from there, yeah. I can't imagine you would launch a business like this if you didn't see a hole in the marketplace. I, I mean, we see the delivery services out there. You have Uber Eats, you have DoorDash. You know, I'll probably get my dinner from a DoorDash uh, tonight. I mean, what are they doing wrong and, and what do you want to change? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, you know, uh, is always with marketplaces when you're sort of in the, in, in the middle, you don't control quality end to end. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're at sort of the, the whim of the, of the local restaurant and also how the food travels. So, uh, you know, DoorDash has to go to the local restaurant, pick up the food and physically deliver it in, in a bag to you. The food is often not hot. It's hard to get or imagine getting, you know, a really good quality piece of fish or steak or French fries after, after traveling. So we, we sort of solve that by cooking it right outside your door. So I think heat and the quality of the food is obviously a, a big thing. Also the predictability of service. We know exactly where the truck is. We know how many minutes it'll take to get to you. So when you order it, instead of seven minutes, it'll pull up in seven minutes and cook the food in about, about 20, 25 minutes. So you, you have food in a, in a very predictable way. The customer service is sort of next level. Um, you're getting it delivered from somebody in a chef uniform and hat. They'll bring it to your door. They'll put it on a, on a table because of COVID and step away and let you open the door and take the, the items off of the, the little um, uh, table that we set up. Um, it's a very good experience. We'll even explain the food to you. If it's Bobby Flay, it'll come on actual uh, silver, with silverware in China. And then you'll just put it in a bag when you're done eating and come pick up the bag. So fine dining is done with silverware, but even the, the, the lower end restaurants, burgers and pizza and things like that are done with very minimal packaging because you're just bringing it from the truck to the door. You're, you're right there. So it's a big advantage. Not to sound lame, and I, I don't like the word democratize, but I'm going to use it. You, it sounds like you're democratizing good food. That's exactly right. We are, in fact, democratizing, giving people access to great food, food that you couldn't otherwise get. So what's interesting about Bobby Flay, for example, is a great example. In order for you to put a physical Bobby Flay restaurant somewhere, you need to have enough people in proximity that are going to come to the restaurant and be able to turn enough tables to cover the fixed you know, expense of building that restaurant. Lots of places, for obvious reasons, it's not going to work. You can't put thousands of Bobby Flay restaurants around the country. But with the, the mobile kitchens, it's very, it's variable. We can break even with five orders on a night uh, from Bobby Flay. I actually even make money with five orders. So if you, if there's five orders of demand in a town, we could send a Bobby Flay truck into the night, hit those five orders and make money. And that's all the demand there is, it's five. If there's 10, we'll add two. If there's 15, we'll add three. But we don't need to add a restaurant where you need to have hundreds of, of, of people a night want the food. So it's a big advantage. And it does democratize because we're able to bring food to areas that don't have it. Also, the thing I'm really passionate about is, is a lot of these you know, food deserts where people can't 
get access to, you know, uh, vegetables even, you know, and, and just like, you know, reasonably nutritious, wholesome food, um, people eating McDonald's and fast food and not getting, uh, you know, eating vegetables and things. And we're now able to offer um, in many of those areas, we'll be able to offer, you know, nutritious options for people uh, and certainly um, be able to do it at a good price. We've got two family style dinner options, which is like 37 or $40 to feed a family of four or five. And you get, in one case, you can get taco dinner. The other case, you can get chicken, veggies, potatoes, and things like they're, they're, they're wholesome, good meals for, you know, what comes out to be, you know, $8 a person, which is not that different even than, than fast food. This sounds like a capital intensive business. Are, are you out there pounding the pavement and, and raising money? It, it is capital intensive. We have raised quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not disclosing exactly how much, but it has been reported by a number of people. And, uh, and you're correct. Uh, we've, we've proven the model. And in order to scale it, we're going to need a lot of capital, which I always love businesses like that because it really provides that nice moat around the business. Um, it's not something that you can just whip up, you know, uh, a technology for and put it out to the world. You literally have to go town to town and build the infrastructure and build the pipes. N no different than, you know, putting Walmart super centers and building them and rolling them out across the country. It feels a little bit like that. I promised myself I would not ask you about Walmart. So I'm not asking. I'm not, I don't, I'm not going down that route. I'm not going down <laughs> that route, Mark. Not doing it. Uh, okay. So wonders, you're leading wonders. So when you're not doing that, uh, you're also, you recently launched VCP uh, with A-Rod and yeah. now you're a part owner of the, the Minnesota Timber, Timberwolves and the Lynx. Why basketball? Oh, bas I mean, I, I was a huge sports fan growing up, loved playing sports. I didn't really play basketball, but loved playing other sports and watching basketball and watching all the sports and following the stats and things. And just, I guess, a childhood dream, you know, to, to be involved, you know, as an owner at that level. And when the opportunity came up, it was too good to pass up. And it's been, it's delivered on, on everything I had hoped for and more. I, I absolutely love it. It's so, it's so fun. <laughs> is it fair to say, or do you drive a turnaround at a, at a do you view the Timber, Timberwolves as a company? How do you approach doing whatever you're going to do with the brand? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, alongside with Alex and working with, with Becky at, uh, and Glenn, because, you know, they're still the control owners for the next two years, but you're applying this VCP framework, this idea of vision capital people, and going through the exercise of figuring out what exactly is the vision? Where do we want to be in 10 or 15 years? What's the strategy to get there? What's the right organizational structure to support that? What does success look like? How do we, you know, put metrics around it? What is the mission? What are the values? How are we going to live these in a new way? What kind of culture do we want to create? What kind of people do we want to hire? What traits do we want to look for in, in those people? like going through the, that, that hard work and exercise, because I think in, in a company organization, I, I assume it's going to be the same for a team. It always comes down to the, to the culture and the people. If you could bring in the very best people in the world and they're motivated and they give you the best they got, you're going to, you're going to, you know, make good things happen. And that's where, where we're focused right now is just building that, that foundation. Um, but you asked there about the v VCP uh, fund, Vision Capital People uh, Venture Fund that Alex and I uh, have started. Really, that came out of, you know, just me as an entrepreneur sort of being uh, frustrated um, the way that the venture model works, which is, hey, here's like a million dollars, you know, do a little bit. Then here, if you do well, we'll give you a few million more. And if that goes well, we'll give you a few million more. And it's sort of this very incremental sort of thing. I'm a big believer that um, if you have enough capital up front, and you don't have to worry about constantly raising money and you can go out and hire the very best people in the world up front. And you're in a big industry with tailwinds and you have an idea to be disruptive and you have a really good founder. It's going to, it's going to work. It's going to work. You need capital and great people. And so many companies I think could work, but they don't because they didn't have the capital and they didn't have the best people. And it's a little bit of this chicken egg problem. So this fund is really about finding a founder that says, hey, I've got this big idea. Okay, great. Here's $10 million. And then we'll help you uh, raise 50 million soon after once you, you know, hire the team and prove the product. And I think there's a real hole in the market uh, for that type of venture fund. And we've done it a few times already before the fund, uh, very successfully. So we're very excited to, uh, you know, to formalize it. I do want to dive back into the fund, Mark, but two questions, uh, two more on the, on the Timberwolves. Uh, where do you see them? Uh, in a decade. What's your vision? Yeah, right now we're working through that, honestly. And uh, uh, I can't tell you exactly, you know, but 
you know, come a few months from now, once we finish this exercise, we'll be able to articulate it very clearly exactly where we want to go. Um, obviously, we want to we want to start winning, like like any team uh, is about winning. Um, but more so, how do we want to be viewed by by the world? You know, what do we want to be known for, admired for? Um, it goes beyond winning. It has to be on and off the court. We know that. We just haven't finished the exercise to be able to articulate it in the right way. You know, I'm a bit of a basketball fan too. And lastly, you know, on, on the Wolves, uh, I mean, the, the everything that's going on with the pandemic and, and how it's impacting sports. I mean, do you think the season just goes through without a hitch? Uh, what do you think? Um, I don't I think there'll be hitches, <laughs> but I think we'll get through it. I think we'll get through it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just the way life is these days. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, on, in, on VCP, uh, you know, how do you find a good opportunity? How, do, when you are sitting in that room, or I guess on video calls with, with A-Rod, um, how do you say, you know what, that makes sense? I'm going to put money behind it. Yeah, a lot of businesses make sense. It usually comes down to the founder. And I think this is unique too, maybe because I'm a founder, but I, I believe more in the founder than the idea. And I think uh, a great founder could make a bad idea work, um, but a, a bad founder will, will mess up a good idea, you know, a great idea. So it's like, it is definitely founder first. If you get a founder that has really got passion for disrupting a big market, it's got to be a big opportunity. So assume it's a big market and they have a disruptive idea. It's not really for us to say yay or nay, because we might not be experts in that industry, but if, but if we believe in the founder and the founder has a track record of success and they're passionate um, about disrupting a big industry that just requires capital and great people, if we believe that that's the case, then we're all in, you know, we, but it, getting, it always comes back to the founder. Are you getting a lot of pitches right now? We've seen a lot of, and you know, we're not going to go down this rabbit hole of deal activity, but we are seeing a lot of companies you know, sell in this environment. Are, are you getting swamped with, with ideas and pitches? Uh, I wouldn't say swamp, but you know, it's, we're getting a steady flow of, of, of people. Yeah reaching out to us. We also have our own ideas. We see, you know, industries that we feel could be uh, in need of disruption and we'll go out and find a founder to, to help us do that as well. So it's mm-hmm. sort of a combination. Of the two. Was it hard to sell your businesses? Um, was it hard? I think, you know, I always talk about this thing, selling versus selling out. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, at, at diapers.com, Quincy, when we sold it to Amazon, it was sort of depressing because we had a big vision and we were sort of going after, going after it. And when we sold the company, it was sort of like, okay, you guys just keep doing what you're doing over here and like stay out of, stay out of our way, you know, a little bit. And it was very depressing because it was like the vision was gone. The vision we had uh, no longer existed. And that was sort of like selling out. When, when we sold to Walmart, it was just the opposite. It was like, here you go. Here are the keys. Um, bring Jet, bring Walmart.com, bring it together. And now the vision you had, it's our vision too. We're going to give you capital and you're going to be able to get there faster with a higher probability of success. Go at it. So that didn't feel like selling. It felt invigorating. It felt great. And I think that the team really enjoyed, enjoyed those four years at Walmart um, and helping, helping to sort of uh, turn, turn, that, turn that around. So um, I guess it was one case yes, one case no. <laughs> yeah, I've been on the record before. I, I, I think that acquisition uh, by Walmart of Jet, Jet.com really was a turning point in the company's history and, and absolutely changed uh, their corporate culture, you know, as you as a serial entrepreneur, I mean, that's what everybody calls you. What did you learn from walking, working inside that, that Walmart culture for, for, for so many years? Yeah. I mean, I kind of, kind of learned the same lessons over, but in different ways that just mm-hmm. become, you know, further reinforcing like this idea of it's all about the people. So Walmart had the right vision. Talk about BCP. They had the vision, they had the capital, you know, when I came into the e-com business and when we came in, I don't think the the, the people uh, were really at, at the level that that they needed to be to get to the next level, and so it was really about changing the narrative so that we could put ourselves in a position to hire the best people. That was something I learned. That was like it wasn't something I, I knew going in. It was sort of like, wait a second, how do we change this so that the best people want to work here? Because I'm not used to that in startups. The best people want to work for hot startups. So that's easy. When you're in a company like Walmart with like legacy history. Uh, it's much harder to bring in the very best people. And so it occurred to me, we have to change the narrative. And what that required was making a lot of moves where any one of them on its own, maybe wasn't a good decision. Like if you were to evaluate, you know, was it smart to do this? Was it smart to do that? 
But when you put it all together, it changed the narrative. And we suddenly started to, to be able to put ourselves in a position to hire great people. And once we hired the great people, it took a few years. That's when things really started to, to move. It was the people at the end of the day that made the difference at Walmart. Mm -hmm. Last time I talked to you, I was thinking before we came here, was a day I believe that you said you were leaving Walmart almost a year. So I hop on the phone. It was still in my office kind of pre-pandemic. And Mark, what are you up to next? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a city. Sure. Great. Good luck with that. You know, maybe you'll invite me someday, but this is actually happening. It's called Tolosa. Uh, where, where are you at uh, with this city that you're trying to create from nothing? Yeah, we're right now we're in the process of starting to figure out what state it makes sense and where land's available. We're thinking about, you know, needing about 200,000 acres to create a city of 5 million people. And so this 2022 is about, you know, trying to identify the, the right location. We're also bringing up on board, um, you know, members that, that you know, share the same passion we have, um, believe in the mission. The mission is really, uh, uh, you know, just to simply create a more equitable, sustainable future. Um, that's really what the project's about. It's not about building a city. It's not a real estate project. This is a not-for-profit, you know, uh, community foundation, Tolosa Community Foundation, that's going to own the land and help this city come to be. And with the appreciation of the land that comes back to the foundation, foundation is going to create an endowment that's going to invest in social services like education, healthcare, and, and jobs training, and affordable housing in a way that makes it feel like a social democratic type uh, country. But we're not doing it by increasing taxes. We're doing it through the wealth created by the land appreciation that's caused by uh, and from people moving to a place where the land is virtually worthless. Um, and that's the idea, the big, the big uh, vision here. I've seen the, the coverage of this. It, it seems incredibly well thought out. What made you come up with it? Yeah, I, I mean, just um, like, like many people, just uh, frustrated with you know, all this material progress that we're making as a country. There's still people just barely getting by. And it seemed perplexing, you know, didn't understand it. And was sort of researching, reading, came across this book, Progress in Poverty by Henry George late uh, 19th century economist that basically proves that the problem with capitalism is the way in which uh, we own land. And so if you think about it, you know, monopolies, um, you know, bad for capitalism. They did exist at one point and it was terrible for workers. And then antitrust laws were put in place to make sure that there are competitive uh, forces. That's the only way capitalism works. Well, land ownership is a little bit of, of a monopoly. You own a piece of land and you can literally price it to the point where people are no, no longer willing to work. And he sort of proves this in economic theory and I found it fascinating and thought, well, would it be an incredible way to test um, you know, uh, changing capitalism a little bit to fix that? And the way we came up with it was, oh, we need worthless land and we're gonna have a community foundation own the land, it's worthless. If people move there and the land like appreciates in value, we could take all that, capture all that appreciation and give it back to the citizens. We feel that that's more equitable and, and, and fair. It doesn't mean you can't buy land in, in Telosa, but you'll be buying it from the community foundation after it's captured this massive appreciation that occurs from you know uh, an acre in the desert's worth a couple thousand dollars. If people move there, it could be worth millions of dollars. And so why is it worth millions of dollars? Because communities were formed and tax dollars were invested in infrastructure around those communities. It only serves to reason that that money would come back to the citizens that helped create the value. And so that's what we're testing. It's this new model for society. We're sort of calling it equitism because it's like a more equitable form of capitalism, but um, it's getting a lot of traction. Like people like the idea of having these great social services without having to increase taxes to cover it. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the unlock. And did I have this right? $400 billion to create this and, and might be done by 2040? Uh, yeah, but 2030, we'll have the, the, the center of it done. Uh, 50,000 people roughly uh, living there by 2030. And then over the next decade, a million and the decade after that to 5 million. So, you know, it's a, it's almost a 30 year process uh, to get to 5 million people, but we feel it's, it's achievable. Uh, it's going to be, it's obviously a huge, huge lift, but we've got a lot of great people that are motivated to see this happen. And uh, yeah, we're going to... Oh, everything you worked on is really mind blowing. But to me, you're still the guy that founded Jet.com and worked at Walmart e-commerce operations. Mark Laurie, 
Uh, good to see you. I can talk to you for another hour about this stuff, but I know you're a busy guy of a um, thousand jobs. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Brian. Thanks All for right. joining Yahoo Finance. Take care.